What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Oh, there's not a BDG on the. I done switched up the logo a little bit to make it look better on apparel. This is Big Dogs Got to Eat Fantasy Football. I mean, we're 11 seconds into the podcast. I'm already causing problems. There we go. Much better. This is BDG Eat. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. We are bike and better than ever. Today's one of my favorite episodes because I get to say, not because of the content, because I get to say the word bike like 40 times and it's good for SEO. You guys are not allowed to get it pissed at me or annoyed at me for saying bike because we're talking bounce bike players today for 2020 fantasy football. Dudes who might have taken a step back last year, they dropped off. Maybe it was injury related. Maybe it was situation related. Maybe it was opportunity related. I don't know, but it was something related. That doesn't mean they're finished. We could squeeze the juice left inside of their fantasy goodness so today we're going position by position i'm gonna take my number one favorite bounce bike player at each position i might touch on a couple other guys but i want to take the number one at each tuck your big dog shirt in stop yelling let's eat All right, I want to give a quick shout out to the homies that listen to the podcast via iTunes and they actually listen to the podcast and they don't have to see me face to face. I respect that. I got two reviews and I'm going to give a draft guide away to both of y'all. First one is from No One Swagger Like Me. This is for the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football podcast. He said, what's cracking big dogs? I don't care what anybody says. These guys produce the perfect balance of quality and quantity fantasy football content the boys are straight grinders and it shows if you want to win your leagues the big dogs are the only ones you need to be listening to they're also hilarious which makes their content that much better i don't know about the latter part but we're definitely out here trying to help you win the chip the second review is from matt amp 96 and this is not for the big dogs this is for my new podcast called why you yelling where i'm covering everything in the world outside of fantasy football marketing business real life relationships whatever 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 if you're interested in my thoughts on things outside of fantasy football y'all can go check out why you yelling this is a review from that lasagna for thoughts i actually really like the title of this review this is easily the most refreshing podcast i've listened to in a while i say refreshing because yes these are some difficult conversations that come with difficult times but these are genuine thoughts and knowledgeable opinions and facts it's nice to hear from someone that sounds like they've done their homework on topics and overall just easy to listen to and vibe so matt and no one swagger like me please shoot me over an email nick at bigdogsfantasy.com let me know that that is you and i will give y'all access to the free draft guide draft guide goes live on july 1st for season long my top 100 rankings for season long went live this morning so let's run this content bike quarterback bounce bike player of the year there are a few guys to choose from i think matt stafford makes sense i think big ben makes sense but we're going with terrific thomas terrific thomas brady last year finishes as the quarterback 16 in points per game if you had him he started off real nice he dipped off he wasn't a guy that you wanted to start in your lineups currently going off the board at quarterback 11 and i don't even think that's high enough right now he's i believe number eight or nine in my rankings y'all will have to go check that out on the big dog draft guide when i look at what happened last year and how i project him forward this year obviously playing on tampa bay the new england group of weapons that he was playing with last year was some of the worst that he's had in his career so far it was like literally nothing outside of julian edelman they had no ground game going with sony michelle i really don't know what people expected tom brady to do last year their offensive line also took a step back they dealt with a lot of injuries and i get he's not the 2012 tom brady anymore he's not in his prime he's old as shit but you don't have to be an elite passer to ball out in fantasy now he moves over to tampa warm weather and arguably the best supporting cast of his career. Chris Godwin, who is a bigger, faster, better version of Julian Edelman in the slot, basically. You have Mike Evans, you have Gronk coming over. We're going to get a lot of two tight end sets over there. They said it's their base offense. I don't know how much I'm really reading into that comment by Bruce Arians, but if that's the case, you're getting Mike Evans, you're getting Chris Godwin, you're getting Rob Gronkowski, you're getting an athletic OJ Howard or Cameron Brate, another really good red zone. Tom Brady might honestly, with all the red zone options he has, might throw for fucking 48 touchdowns. But in all seriousness, this is going to be an extremely tough offense for defenses the game plan around tbtb tampa bay tom brady tom brady tampa bay this is not an easy game plan to schedule around so we talked about the offensive line i think most people's initial reaction to tampa bay's offensive line is that oh well he's gonna struggle in tampa bay too because their offensive line fucking stinks not the case they actually weren't bad last year they were number 10 overall in pff's 
pass blocking grades. Then they went out and added the beast from Iowa, Tristan Wirfs, with their first round pick. They traded up to 13 to get him. So that boosts their offensive line. I don't think Brady's going to have too much trouble staying in the pocket and having enough time to let his receivers get open. So you have the weapons, you have the offense that he's entering in terms of Bruce Arians offense. And I think we're just going to get a beautiful combination of fantasy goodness coming out. And last year, you look at Jameis Winston, right? In this offense, 626 pass attempts were the most in the NFL. He tied with Jared Goff for the most pass attempts in the NFL last year for a quarterback. Arians loves to throw the ball. Sure, they might go a little bit more run heavy. They might run the ball more than they did last year because they're not going to be trailing as much. Tom Brady ain't throwing 35. I feel like Tom Brady might have as many career interceptions as Jameis Winston threw all of last year. Probably fake news, but also possibly not. So yeah, maybe a little bit more run heavy, but they are not an offense set up to run the damn ball. Since Arians got his first real stint as the OC back in Indy in 2012, the seven offenses that he has had control over, five of the seven have ranked top 12 in terms of pass attempts. And most notably, probably the most relevant to a guy like Tom Brady were those years in Arizona with Carson Palmer when he resurrected his career. So Brady fell off a little bit last year for sure, but he's still ranked top 10 among NFL quarterbacks in terms of passing yards, completed air yards, pass attempt distance, and number nine in deep ball completion percentage. Again, I echo, he did all those things with a horrendous downfield supporting cast. The upgrade cannot be overstated. The weapons group that he's going from to. And last year, he did all that. Again, per PFF, only 10.1% of Brady's throws were downfield. Only 10.1% of them were deep balls per PFF. 20 plus yards down the field. 15.8%, so almost 16%, almost 6% higher number of his throws downfield. Fourth in the NFL. If they meet just in the middle somewhere, Plus, adding in the fact that most of those throws are now going to Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Rob Gronkowski, the efficiency is going to be higher. The volume is going to be the volume is going to be higher. Right now, you look at what Vegas has Brady pegged for. They have him at 4225 in terms of passing yards. So 40, a little bit over 4200 passing yards, 29 and a half touchdowns with the juice on the over. If you're in a six point per passing touchdown league, I think Brady is an absolute smash at his current ADP. Maybe you reel it back in. Maybe he's just a value in four point per passing touchdown leagues. I don't see him throwing for 4,800 yards. He's not going to put up the yardage that Jameis Winston did, but the touchdown numbers I think are going, this is going to be a very efficient offense. This is going to be an offense where when they get into the red zone, they're going to score and they are going to score a lot via the air. I think Brady's 30 passing touchdowns is probably right around the, the correct mark. And if you're throwing for 30 passing touchdowns in fantasy, you're going to be a top eight fantasy quarterback. So I think Brady is an absolute stud play here. He currently has the fourth best odds per Vegas to lead the NFL in passing yards as well. So those numbers overall, again, put him in the top five to top eight fantasy quarterbacks in Vegas. I'll always say this is not black and white, but it gives you a realistic projection of where the market has him. So love Brady for a little light bounce bike this year. His fantasy demise has been greatly, greatly greatly exaggerated. I did touch on Matt Stafford. I touched on Big Ben. Those will be popular names for bounce back. And uh, after talking with Dr. Morse last week and the week prior to that, if you missed, I have Dr. Morse from the Fantasy Doctors come on and we discuss all the players that are relevant injury wise going into 2020 fantasy football. We had an episode on quarterbacks and running backs and then wide receivers, tight ends. The following week, we talked about Stafford and Big Ben, and he's actually not worried about either of those guys, which is music to the ears of fantasy football players. He's doing his whole other entire injury draft guide, which will be included in the Big Dogs draft guide, which you can get all of that for 10 bucks if you go to monkeyknifefight.com and you sign up promo code BDGE. Do that. You throw 10 bucks in there when you deposit. They'll give you 20 bucks to play with. As soon as you play a game, it'll notify them, which will notify me, and I'll get you access to the draft guide. You will get that email the next day. So you have the Big Dogs draft guide. You'll have Dr. Morse's injury guide. 20 bucks to play with on Monkey Knife Fight. It's a deal of a goddamn lifetime. But yeah, I mean, as long as we're not nervous about Stafford or Big Ben being injured, which Dr. Morse isn't, uh, Stafford was obviously on pace last year for really, really, really premier fantasy quarterback numbers. So I think Stafford is good, but I really have more, I have more confidence in Brady being a big time player this year in fantasy than I do in Stafford. So if I'm picking one or the other straight up, I'm going to go Brady over Stafford. Yell at me in the comments if you disagree. Let's move over to pass catchers. Wide receivers. There are, this is, this was the toughest section to write. Actually, I lied. I'm probably going to preface every position with that same statement. This was tough because there were so many choices. Running back and tight end, there were almost no choices that I liked. But for wide receiver, I mean, we could look at guys like Juju, Odell Beckham Jr., T.Y. Hilton, Brandon Cooks. And I actually like all of those guys. I think they're all pretty good values. But my personal favorite and who I have highest in my ranking, so who I am most confident in bouncing bike this year, is Adam Thielen. I talked about him in, in very deep depth, in the deepest of depths, 
talking ocean floor depths in the wide receiver rankings video last week. But I'm going to add, as I always do, a little extra big fact sauce on top of what I talked about. Right now, current ADP for Adam Thielen, wide receiver 16, super flex 54th overall, non-super flex 42nd overall. So we're talking about the 506 in super flex. We're talking about the 406 in non-super flex. And I love this. If you were going running back heavy in the beginning of drafts, which you should be doing this year, Thielen is the perfect mid-round wide receiver to bolster that receiver group. And I think he's, I don't want to say a short thing because there's no such thing as a short thing. But listen, Adam Thielen, top 12 this year. Ain't no fucking doubt about it. It makes no sense that he's going this late given Stefan Diggs is gone. The target funnel that was the Minnesota offense last year was fucking major, big major. You look back at what Stefan Diggs' numbers were over the previous three years. 21% target share in 2019, 26% in 2018, 21% in 2017. So over those three years, 23% target share, the air yard share, that is where you need to feast your eyes on. 41% of Minnesota's air yards last year went to Stefan Diggs. 30% the year prior, 31% the year prior. So you're talking about 23% target share, 34% air yard share. Gone. Gone. You could love Justin Jefferson. You could love Irv Smith. I don't give a fuck, but Adam Thielen is taking a huge percentage of what Stefan Diggs is leaving on the field. And again, it is very easily for me to rationalize away Adam Thielen's poor year last year because the hamstring injury happened in week seven. If you look at what he did from weeks one through six, he only played in 10 games last year. The first six games, weeks one through six, look at the numbers. I know the volume wasn't crazy, but he's still putting up 14.3 half PPR points per game, 16 and a half full PPR points per game. Those first six games before getting hurt, wide receiver five in points per game behind Julio. And those first six games, he did that while Kirk Cousins was averaging Fewer than 27 pass attempts per game. Second half of the season, Kirk's pass attempts per game jumped up to 33 pass attempts per game. And I see the volume being much closer to that than I do the first six weeks of the season. So, And even if it's in the middle and it is around 31 pass attempts per game, which I think is completely reasonable and would still have Kirk ranked at the bottom portion of the league in terms of quarterback attempts, 31 pass attempts per game, 16 games, that's around 500 pass attempts. You give Thielen a 27% to 30% target share, which is what I expect, and you're going to be looking close to 140, 150 targets. You're getting that in round four, round five. Could be even more now that Diggs is gone, and a lot of those targets are going to convert to deep targets. But more important, because we are worried about... We are worried about the makeup of this offense. What is it going to look like? Are they going to go with more two tight end sets? Are they going to go with Irv Smith and Rudolph on the field at the same time, which pushes both starting wide receivers to the outside? Is that a problem for Thielen? My thesis, biked by the big fikes, is no. Because I'm comparing Adam Thielen, I'm looking at Cooper Cup. Two guys who are slot receivers. And if you've been following my videos, you've probably seen this tweet already. If you're not following me on Twitter, I would make sure you do that at Nick underscore BDGE. Both of these guys have played a lot of slot over the last two years. But if you look at their yards per route run, and that is a predictive measure of you know success in fantasy and success as a receiver overall, Adam Thielen, yards per route run from the slot, 1.92. Yards per route run on the outside, 2.16. And y'all could see it. It's just, he's better on the outside. Cooper Cup is worse. Obviously, he is, he is a pure slot guy. And I would gladly take both of them, again, at their current ADPs, late fourth, early fifth round. But I echo, one of them is a great slot wide receiver. The other, Thielen, is a great wide receiver that happened to play in the slot a lot for this Minnesota Vikings team. At the end of the day, you're looking at Adam Thielen. Who is competing with him for the alpha target role in this offense? Nobody. You can't say that about, this is not a Cooper Cup versus Adam Thielen thing. But if you're looking at Cooper Cup, like that's the argument against that. If they're going the same ADP, like we're not actually sure who the alpha is like you like Cooper cup, but I'm sure he's a great value there, but Robert Woods could easily end up with more targets there, more production there. So you look at Adam Thielen. He's the clear alpha target in this offense with Stefan Diggs gone. Kirk and him have fantastic chemistry already. And Thielen has already shown NFL elite production went healthy many, many times over the course of his, you know, shorter ish NFL career. So he might be older, but I don't think Adam Thielen is out of his prime, just the way he plays. And just a little a little added note there, a little a extra incentive, I think, worth noting, right? We're dealing with the whole Dalvin Cook holdout situation. If he does hold out, you have to assume that they are going to be going way more pass heavy this year, right? They're not going to be feeding the group of Madison, Mike Boone, Amir Abdullah, 30 carries a game. They are going to go more pass heavy. I'm sure their defense is still going to be one of the better defenses in the league, but some guys that they lost this year on defense, 
Everson Griffin, Xavier Rhodes, Trey Wayans, Linval Joseph. So they did sign Michael Brockers to replace Joseph, but they're going to have a lot of new starters on defense. And this, you know, continuity plays a big role on NFL teams. And the fact that they're not really, they're not together yet. They're not learning the defense together yet. Looks to me that they're going to be more pass heavy this year. So, dude, I, I can't get enough of Adam Thielen in the late fourth, early fifth round. And then we're talking about Juju and Odell Beckham. Who do I feel more comfortable bouncing back out of those two? I just, I'm just having... I need to know who you guys who you guys peg for a bounce back year between those two. You think both of them are going to bounce back? I don't. I don't know. I can't. I don't think I could buy into that. But if you had to choose one for your redraft league for your redraft roster, say you have not picked a wide receiver yet, you went running back early, you fucking smashed on Derrick Henry, and then on the way back you took I don't know Kenyon Drake or Josh Jacobs or something. You need to pick your wide receiver one round three, round four. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Juju, Odell. Don't fucking lie to me. We need big facts in the comment section. Comment who you want between those two. I have made my mind up, and it is the young king out in Pittsburgh. I will be taking Juju over Odell Beckham this year. His current ADP is a wide receiver 14, 45th overall in Superflex, 41st overall in non-Superflex. I won't say I'm even close to as confident in Juju's bounce back as I am for Adam Thielen. I think Juju will have a fine year. Let's start with the red flags. Like, regardless of who is under center, you would think that Juju last year should have operated as the alpha in this receiving group. Juju was up as high as, like, wide receiver two, one, even in some drafts, three, and dynasty drafts last offseason. And you don't see guys like, you know, if you're a true alpha, like we wanted Juju to be, Michael Thomas, DeAndre Hopkins, you don't see those dudes' numbers falling off when they're playing with a backup quarterback. That's what concerns whether it's a good arm, an accurate arm, a running quarterback, a shitty backup quarterback. Those dudes are eaten and they are commanding targets regardless. That's not what we saw from Juju last year. So he played in 12 games. He had individual receiving yardage lines in those 12 games of 15, 7, 16, 44, 21, 22, and 6. In order to have drafted Juju last year, you had to have used your second round redraft pick on him. So he legitimately, he only played in 12, and those were seven of the 12 receiving yardage lines for him. He legitimately put you up seven of 12 weak losing production type games. Like if he's in your second round, you need big numbers week in and week out. He trailed James Washington last year in receiving yards per game. He trailed Deontay Johnson in receptions per game, and he scored just three touchdowns in 12 games. So that just doesn't seem like it's something that would happen to a true alpha. And I'm I'm really, I'm curious to hear from the Pittsburgh fans out there. I love getting feedback from, from people who are fans of the teams of the fantasy players I talk to, because they obviously have a very close perspective and follow the games most of the time. What do you think was the biggest problem? Obviously it was a quarterback issue, of course, but all of the wide receivers dealt with the same quarterback issue and these other guys produced at the same if not better level than juju so overall takeaway Steelers fans or guys who watch all the Pittsburgh games whoever whatever category you fall into what is your takeaway from juju what do you think was the biggest downfall of juju I'm, I'm assuming you still love him as a player you have to after the 2017 2018 season he was just so 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 good but I would like some extra insight while I do think you can largely write off Big Ben again Again, why was there not a bigger discrepancy between Juju and the other guys? Well, as I did say, he played in 12 games because he missed four through injury. So there's a, a strong possibility that the injuries he suffered played a big role because he did come out the year early, get injured, and pretty much everything lingered through the entirety of the season. Starting in the very first game, Juju suffered a toe injury which is definitely one of those injuries in, in football that will linger for the entirety of the year if you don't let it rest. And in football, we don't have time to fucking let anything rest because the NFL is like, fuck y'all, you're going to play Sunday night, they're going to play Thursday morning, then you know what, we might make you play Friday morning as well. They don't give a fuck about player safety, clearly. So when you get a toe injury, you've got no time to let it heal. So that's something that could have lingered. He ends up retweaking it like a few weeks later, and then again a few weeks later, suffers a concussion, then a knee injury. And he was definitely far less than 100% healthy last year. So you can rationalize away a lot of, I think, what happened to Juju last year. One big topic of conversation going into last year, and I admittedly was not concerned about Antonio Brown leaving and Juju stepping into the alpha role, was just that. You know, that was a big topic. Was Juju capable of stepping into that number one role and taking on the top cornerbacks. So some people might be like, yeah, well, now that he's operating more as an outside wide receiver, that's why he wasn't good. I do have a little fact for you. And it ain't a little fact. It's a big fucking fact. Juju played more in the slot in 2019 than he did in 2018. Okay? So him operating as the alpha more on the outside didn't even happen. So that can't be the excuse as to why he dipped off. He played at a higher percentage in the slot last year without AB than he did in 2018. That's a fact. That's a big fucking fact. That ain't a guess. That ain't an opinion. That's real life.
Sorry. But then they did go out, draft Chase Claypool, assuredly going to play on the outside. So they they do want to keep Juju in the slot. So I like Juju for a bounce back this year. Maybe we need to, maybe I need to adjust expectations for the ceiling that he can give us. I don't think top three fantasy wide receiver is his range of outcomes, but at wide receiver 14, 15, I think there's a good chance that he finishes in that wide receiver 10 to 13 range. But, you know, Deontay Johnson could take a step up. James Washington was, for as, for as much as he's getting kind of thrown to the side, he had a, he had a relevant... Uh, a relevant year last year. He was pretty productive given the quarterback situation as well. So you have other weapons developing outside of Juju Smith-Schuster that I think could actually help him if Deontay Johnson progresses into 70% of what AB was. And I think he's talented enough to hit like somewhat of a range of where, or at least how Antonio Brown operated on the outside. We will see a lot less coverage on Juju. So I'm a little bit torn on Juju here, but I do think that there are positive signs for 2020. And he, I would take him over OBJ. Just, I just, nothing about that Cleveland situation last year was appetizing to me. The connection between Baker and OBJ was just non-fucking existent. And every year, OBJ puts out like a fucking Instagram video of like him working out shirtless. And he's like, I'm back better than ever. Like for the people that retweet that and get excited about that, you realize he does that same shit every single season. And like he hasn't done shit in three years. So the connection there was just something was off there. Something was off in Cleveland last year. And they just have so many weapons. Kareem Hunt's a legit passing game option. Jarvis Landry obviously has been outproducing Odell Beckham. They got David Njoku. They bring in Austin Hooper. I don't know, man. It's shaky there. With Kevin Stefanski coming in, they're going to be very, very run heavy. So if the volume's not there for OBJ, which I don't expect it to be, like, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not buying into, like, the talent, the hype that we get about OBJ because of the one fucking one-handed catch that he had. So he's not necessarily a guy I'm avoiding, but at his price where I'm going to have to take him, I probably will be avoiding him this year. Let's talk running bikes. Running bikes. So for me, bounce, bounce bike, running bike, BBRB. There's one name and one name only here. So let's be honest. It's David Johnson. Psych, motherfuckers! You thought I was gonna say David Johnson? You stupid, stupid. Listen, I'm gonna do a lot of running back focused videos this summer because after all, that's that's what wins you the chip in, in redraft leagues and fantasy, right? My overall strategy for, for running backs is typically stay away from these older guys who are being ultra hyped solely on the situation that they're in, but not because of talent anymore. They haven't been good for a while. They can't stay on the field. They're inching their way out of their prime. Uh, this seems to be a case for a lot of those running backs like borderline RB2 range this year. I'm talking about the guys like David Johnson, Todd Gurley, James Conner. Le'Veon Bell, etc. So David Johnson, I'm just I'm just good there. This is this is an off. He, his worst attribute is running inside. So yes, you could throw out all the Carlos Hyde numbers that you want, but David Johnson is has been really bad running the ball inside over like the last three years. He hasn't been good doing that for a long time. And this is an offense that does not throw to the running backs. Sean Watson just does not throw to his running back. So the best part about David Johnson is his pass catching ability, of course. And, you know, no matter how old you get, you still have good hands like David Johnson does. I'm going to be staying away from David Johnson. Todd Gurley, listen, I'm a Falcons fan and I want nothing to do with Todd Gurley. They're already concerned about his health and they haven't even fucking stepped on the field yet. This is just not a good running offense. Dirk Cutter does not know how to run an effective rushing attack on the offensive side of the ball. They're going to throw a lot. They're going to be down a lot. Their defense is still terrible. So they're going to be passing a lot. Where you have to draft these guys, Todd Gurley right now is going 28th overall. That's the beginning of the third round. I, I personally, listen, I can't stand here in good faith and talk to my big dog's family and tell y'all with any sort of confidence, drafting David Johnson or Todd Gurley in the third fucking round is anything short of suicide. Fifth round is probably around the range where you could even start debating these guys. I do like the latter two in this situation, James Conner and Le'Veon Bell. James Conner is the highest ceiling of all these guys, in my opinion. I can't give any analysis past the lazy analysis that everyone gives. If he's healthy, he's going to be really good. That's all I can give. That's all anyone can give. If anyone tries to get more cute than that, don't fucking hit that plus 30 seconds on the podcast, plus 15 seconds about five times until he's done talking about James Conner because he's wasting your time. We know he's going to operate as the workhorse if he is healthy. All you're doing is take is rolling the dice. That's it. If you want to take James Conner, you're rolling the dice on the injury risk. That's it because he's going to operate as a lead back if he's healthy. Conner has eyes upside. Le'Veon Bell, I think, is a fine value pick. I'm not expecting a huge bounce back because that would incline that he's going to do a lot better than he did last year. I don't think that's the case. I think he will perform similar to last year, maybe an extra like 100 yards from scrimmage, an extra two or three touchdowns. I wouldn't consider that a bounce back. I would just consider now that the fact he's going three or four rounds later in drafts, he's a good value, not a bounce back player. So there is one guy I just basically shit on every old veteran running back. There's one guy that I do love. I loved last year and same with the year before. I'm probably going to get a lot of shit for this one, but 
It's Matt Breda. It's fucking Matt Breda, man. I can't get off the Breda bandwagon. The dude is barely 25 years old. He moves out of that San Francisco offense, which we've seen him have plenty of success when he's healthy. Moves over to Miami, where he won't have to take that ground and pound. He won't be the one that gets those early down inside the line carries because they have Jordan Howard there. And you know what Jordan Howard can't do? Catch the fucking ball. I'm going to let y'all read this for about two seconds. Jordan Howard, not good enough to command targets in the passing game. Miami is an offense that threw the ball on 66% of their plays last year. That is second, second in the NFL, only behind Dirk Cutter's ungrateful ass leading the Falcons. Miami's win total this year, per Vegas, six games, bottom five in the NFL. They're going to trail a lot, and they're going to pass again a lot. This is a complete late round, high upside pick, which injury is already, obviously Breida is one of the more fragile running backs in the league, but that is factored into his 11th, 12th round RB38 to RB40 price tag. I actually don't hate Jordan Howard either as a value pick later on in the draft. I think he's probably penciled in for 180, 200 carries. You want to talk about him getting the goal line work? Like the entire Miami backfield had a total of 11 goal line carries in 2019. So even if Jordan Howard got all of those, which he's not going to, they'll probably split it up. He'll get like six. Brado will get three. So fucking Patrick Laird will somehow get two. I, I think the best we can hope for for Jordan Howard this year is probably like not 800 to 900 total yards from scrimmage and five to six touchdowns, which is, you know, you don't hate that in the 10th round. But I think Breda has really, really, really high upside that no one's talking about. I think he could be a very big factor in the passing game. And he's just an explosive guy that this offense is going to need playmakers out of they need something out of the backfield that has some sort of explosion and that is Matt Breda so I like Breda there man as, as a bounce back player someone who was really just taken out of fantasy conversations because of injury but he's still very he's not like 27 28 he just turned 25 so he's still in the prime of his career if we can hit fucking lightning in a bottle if we can catch lightning in a bottle hit that perfect wave hit that perfect storm where Breda stays healthy for a year he could be an extremely, extremely, extremely good pick where he's going in drafts. Let's move over to the final position, and that is the tight end. If you guys have enjoyed the video thus far or the podcast, if you're listening, really, it takes two seconds to scroll down, hit the five stars. You can write a review for me. That would be absolutely beautiful. You really help me out in the podcast store. If you do so, if you're on YouTube, just hit the thumbs up button. It looks like this. It ain't hard to find. Just scroll down. A little clicky click and subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're doing fantasy football videos like this five, literally five days a week. Actually, we do have sort of an announcement. We are rebranding in a sense, not rebranding, but both of the other brands within my channel that y'all know is Fade the Public and Bunk Bed Breakdown. So Bunk Bed Breakdowns is the dynasty show hosted by Noah and Mike and I hop in there when I'm not hung over on Wednesday mornings. They have their own podcast in the iTunes store now. Fade the Public has their own podcast in the iTunes store and they both have their own YouTube channels. I will link all this down below. Here's how this is gonna work. All the long form videos that we typically put out Monday to Friday are gonna stay on this channel. But those two other channels are going to have their own exclusive content. I wanted to give them a little bit more creative flexibility because like no one and Mike are always producing new dynasty content or they want to produce dynasty content, but I don't want to saturate my YouTube channel. So I was like, well, why don't we make one for you guys? And they've done like 20 videos already of like rookie profiles and something that we worked on for the draft guide, but they're going to put those up on the YouTube channel for themselves. So you're going to get a lot more extra dynasty content if you go subscribe to their YouTube channel. And then audio, if you're listening via podcast, the full length Fade the Public and Bunk Bed Breakdowns audio for podcasting is only going to go on their podcast from now on. The Wednesday and Friday ones that you've guys gotten accustomed to, if you listen to those, uh, will not be on the Big Dogs iTunes podcast anymore. It'll just be my personal videos the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I'll probably do some Saturday videos throughout the summer. But if you want to listen to the audio, you've got to go subscribe to the Bunk Bed iTunes podcast. And this will also be on Spotify and Google Store and all that shit too. So regardless of where you're listening to, Fade the Public Bunk Bed separated all the brands. It's probably better that we do this for the long term. So go subscribe to all of their channels and podcasts and yada, 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 yada. Let's talk about tight ends. Bounce bike. You know, you might want to put Evan Ingram here and I get the appeal. The upside is obviously there, but he's coming off that Liz Frank surgery and man, they got to put a, a, a screw right into your foot and you're playing with that for the entire year. And I just don't like the, the timeline for Ingram. He got that after the season, February, March-ish. And that's what we saw from Hollywood Brown last year. You, you just got to play with a screw for the entire year. And this is one where you're going to have to re follow the reports very, very, very closely throughout the summer. Again, there's no need for me to explain the type of upside that I think we can get from Ingram when he's healthy. You know, if he's healthy, that analysis is just lazy as fuck without actually putting real context behind it. That's why we bring on guys like that. Uh, Dr. Morse to the channel to discuss 
real injuries with context behind them. We talked about Evan Ingram and he is very, 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 very nervous. So for the most part, I'm telling the big dogs audience to steer clear of Evan Ingram this year, anywhere near his ADP. I think he's going off like tight end six or seven right now. I just think it's not worth the mid round pick where you can get high upside players at other positions for what we're probably going to get in terms of inconsistency, inconsistent play time and possibly a re-injury to his foot. So so we have real, real reports. Maybe they're taking the screw out of real cutting, of real juking and shit like that on the field. Stay, stay clear of Evan Ingram. The tight end position, like the running back position, was tricky because the older dudes completely fell off last year. Like the guys we had gotten accustomed to, the Greg Olsons, the Delaney Walkers, the Rudolphs, like completely fell off and they're no longer in the picture in terms of fantasy tight ends. I'm going to take a bold stance here and I, I will say I'm ready to dip bike into the TJ Hawkinson pool i hyped him heavy last year and he came out on fucking scorching fire week one nine targets six catches 131 yards and a touchdown i think the apartment next to me just heard me yell fire and they probably are coming to make sure that i'm okay so he does that week one and i'm feeling myself y'all can't tell me shit yeah i just called the first rookie breakout in 10 fucking years that game would go on to account for 20 percent of his receptions on the year 36 percent of his yards and one of his total two touchdowns not good nicholas However, I think there is some good to take away. His rookie year was obviously very injury riddled. Uh, after week one, we had concussions. We had a shoulder injury multiple times. He had the wind knocked out of him. Then he had an ankle injury that put him on the IR. So at least we got to see some of that elite prospect profile upside before he did get injured. What we saw from Hawkinson with Stafford on the field wasn't actually that bad. It did not turn into crazy production, but he ranked top 12 in terms of yards per route run among all tight ends in weeks one through nine when Stafford was on the field. He dropped down to 21st in yards per out run with the backups, and his numbers over the back half were absolutely brutal when he was able to get on the field. Again, Stafford played weeks one through nine. For the remainder of the season, among 40 qualified tight ends, TJ Hawkinson's 48% catchable target rate ranked dead last. He dropped zero passes over the back half of the year, but none of them were getting thrown to him. 48% catchable target rate. More often than not, the balls were not even catchable. He never had a chance without Stafford. This is a very tough argument to make just based on the fact that he put up such little production last year. And I feel like you need to be wary when you find yourself arguing against why a guy was bad instead of like why he's good. And that's kind of why what I find myself doing here with Hawkinson. And I'm definitely not drafting him with the plan that, okay, he's going to be good enough to be my tight end one. But my plan this year is that with Hawkinson being a complete afterthought, I feel like he's going really, really late now. I think he's going off the board at like quarterback or tight end 17, 18. He's still very much the same prospect that he was coming into the NFL. Number eight overall draft capital. He's a guy with legit three down NFL skill set. He only played on 48.6% of the snaps last year. So it's not time to give up on Hawkinson yet. And my strategy for 2020 is to grab two of these guys ranked in the you know, tight end nine to tight end 18 range, two of them with upside. One of them will probably hit. Maybe if you want to grab even three of them, I wouldn't hate that depending on how deep your rosters are. So Hawkinson definitely fits that mold as someone who's going very late in the tight end pool with a lot of upside, showed it a little bit on the field with Stafford back healthy. I don't think we're ready to give up on TJ Hawkinson this year. So he is my bounce back guy for this year. Just probably due to lack of other good options. That's all we got for y'all today in the bounce bike video. If you enjoyed the video, thumbs up subscribe to the channel y'all can get the big dogs draft guide dropping on july 1st with all of my rankings the, the top 100 rankings dropped today so it'll be live probably around noon depending on when you're watching this video monkeyknifefight.com if you use the promo code bdge when you deposit 10 bucks you'll get 20 dollars to play with on there go play a game first play a game and then you'll get access to the guide but you'll get the guide for free once you do that You'll get the season-long guide. You'll get the Rookie Dynasty guide. You will get Dr. Morse's injury guide. It's a lot of fucking value for just a little, little bits of money. If you're not in a state that's eligible for Monkey Knife Fight, they'll have it listed on their website in the frequently answered questions section or whatever. Uh, if you're not, then you could just still cop the guide from BigDogsDraftGuide.com. Either way, I love y'all for all, all of the support, the draft guide, the thumbs up, the comments, the hater comments. It's all love. I hope y'all enjoy the rest of your Thursdays, and we'll see you tomorrow on Faith the Public. Make sure you subscribe to their podcast, so if you're listening via audio, love you.